Well, hello, everyone. Happy Sabbath. You know, it's not Sabbath here yet, but we'll be. Welcome to you to this study, the number 94 of the Three Angels' Messages of Righteousness by Faith. And we're nearing the end of these studies. Um, right now we're reading, we, we studied about Wagner and what happened to him, and we're studying about A.T. Jones and what happened to him. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do, for the way that you uh, work upon our hearts and minds, and your mercy and love and patience and forbearing towards us, and the tasks that you have entrusted us with in being your representatives upon this earth. We ask, Lord, that this Sabbath will be a blessing, and that you can help us to represent you in all that we do. We pray for this study, that um, it will be clear and easy to understand. We pray for those watching this video and those participating this evening, that you can give them a clear mind and an open heart. We also pray for the needs of one another. We know that there's many trials that we face. We pray for Dwight and his mom and the health issues that she has as she's getting older. And um, I pray that you can give Dwight strength. And we pray for others, Lord, that um, so many needs that we have in health, in mental health, in spiritual understanding, financial needs, physical needs. And we ask, Lord, that we can trust in you to provide these as we cooperate with you in uh, being Christians. We pray for this work. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, you've given us a task and it's only just begun. So we ask that you can bring a conviction to each person and what they need to do uh, to further this work upon the earth. So we again invite your spirit to be here as we open your word together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again. Now, we're going to be looking at an appeal for evangelical Christianity by E.T. Jones. And we, we started on it last Friday and uh, Friday evening. And uh, then we looked at some history, some experience, and some facts, which he, he quotes in here. Uh, that that he had, there was some information in there. Now, the main thing with A.T. Jones is that he's having a problem with the politics of Adventism, and right, rightly so. I mean, there was a, a lot of politicking going on at that time, after 1888 and before. And uh, this brought discouragement to Jones, I believe, but it also brought out some aspects of his character. In some ways, I identify with Jones, some some aspects of his character. So the one is I've, that I've learned from is I understand that I'm 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 an anti-establishment type. I'm not really a person interested in. I'm not good at working with others. How, how about we put it that way? By nature, right? I, I mean, I n understand from the principles of the gospel, the need to work and cooperate with others who don't necessarily always think the same way you do. And one of the, the big burdens for me, the big difficulties uh, that I had in my early Christian experience was actually joining a church, becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. It was not an easy thing for me. And, and submitting to, to leadership. And, and God always put me in situations where I needed to learn to be submissive in the areas that I could be submissive and, and to recognize that just because things are done differently than I would do doesn't mean I don't wholeheartedly support them as long as they're not against God's word. But, but there is in that my, myself that nature to sort of be independent minded to do things on my own. A good example of this was when I was a little kid that was co commonly put in my report card is uh, it says Teddy doesn't like to play with others. He likes to play by himself. And uh, he likes to do things on his own. 
And that's just the way I was. So I understand, though, from a Christian point of view, uh, why it's important to work with others and to submit to uh, right authority, even if that authority is asking us to do things. Yes, I'm an introvert. I'm extremely introverted, by the way. Um, so I had to learn how to like talk in front of people and stuff like that. So it's not not something that comes naturally. But anyway, um, you know, we have to learn to to work with others. And and I think for me personally, the the aspects of Christian character that had to develop in me in working with others was probably the most difficult part of being a Christian. Like just obeying God, like keeping his commandments, all that kind of stuff. That that that's easy. I shouldn't say it in that way, but you understand what I'm saying. From the nature, there's a natural part of how I was raised to be moral. But when it comes to the other aspect of working with others, that was much more difficult. The idea that um, you know, I, I had to do things that other people wanted me to do that I didn't think made sense. And, and I've done a lot of that in my life. You just have to do it. And 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 you 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 do it your the best that you can, and you know sometimes well it, it's it's probably not going to work out the way that they think. Sometimes it does. Sometimes they're right and I'm wrong. You know that that happens. But I'd much rather just do things on my own, right, than than actually work with people. And you know I was thinking about it recently that um, you know if I had never got married and had a family, I, I don't even know if I would have ever joined a church. I mean. One of the reasons I joined the church is you have a family, you have kids, you want them to be raised as Christians. But as an individual, uh, the idea of going to church, it's it's a social situation, which I'm not very good at. And so I would, you know, circumstances God led in me to understand the importance of church, the importance of fellowship, that there's a body of Christ, that everybody's different, and that... Um, that we shouldn't have a schism in the body. Now, I talk about that because, you know, when we look at what Jones was addressing, what, what he was dealing with, it's it's a difficult situation. So just to give some background, we know, of course, there was this opposition to the message of righteousness by faith, as presented by Jones and Wagner, not just in 1888, but before and after that, that opposition continued. But it continued underground and and by that it's not so much that people were necessarily discussing uh jones's position on righteousness by faith all the time but it it occurred in the politics of the church and we know that there was this conflict between the ministers and the health work many of the ministers were not health reformers and didn't have much interest in it and of course, the health workers, they believe that, you know, it's the right arm of the message. It's the very important part of the work. And so there was these, these conflicts. And then we know what happened with, with Kellogg. So like in 1901, uh, there's this call for reorganization. And, and it's, it's a very involved history. And I'm not an expert on all the details of what was happening in the church, but the church, at that time was very centralized out of Battle Creek. And that is decisions were being made from Battle Creek uh, that affected people that were, and, and remember communication wasn't very great in those days, people making decisions out in the field. And Ellen White wanted to give more autonomy to those out in the field to make decisions that everything didn't have to go through the general conference. And so in 1901, she called for a reorganization of the church. And in 1903, uh, and Jones mentions this in some ex history, some experiences, some facts, that there was, there was things that were, there was uh, things that he did not agree with that were being done or not being done that should have been done. And things that you know, shouldn't have been done were being done in his view. And I think that some of these things were ways of 
this is just my opinion from the very little that I know, but from my experience with other people, is that when there is a conflict, either of personalities or of belief, that other areas become battlegrounds. So that a lot of this was this, it just was opposition to A.T. Jones. And I think he sensed that, that decisions were being made, or at least he believed, that decisions were being made in opposition to him. So an, an example, you know, that I've, I've noticed in, in my own life is, let's say there's somebody that has a problem with me, right? Now, if I have an idea and I present an idea, because that person has a problem with me, they're going to be opposed to that idea. But if somebody else had presented the same idea, they would have supported it, right? That is, it's not the idea, it's where it's coming from. And and we also, you know, to say that other people have just done it, I myself have had uh, times when, you know, an idea is being presented and I have a personal problem with that person in how I perceive them. And, you know, so it's like, well, you know, my na- my nature is is opposed to whatever it is that they're suggesting. But then, you know, I think about it. Why am I why am I opposed? Why do I have these feelings about what this person is saying? Why can't I look at it objectively? And and then I and, and sometimes, you know, I'm able to then step back and recognize that my personal feelings are affecting my perspective. And 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 we've all done that. I mean, if you haven't done that, then I'm, I'm pretty amazed. But I think we all have done that. We somebody we don't like presents an idea, and we're immediately opposed to it just because of them as a person. So this is what was happening, I believe, at this stage of Adventism. I've read lots of Ellen White's uh, councils, um, even the earlier history in. Uh, if you read Testimonies Volume 5, which Heidi and I went through, it, it's very clear that the church is in bad shape because of these types of conflicts, personality conflicts, and that it's people just aren't acting as Christians in in any way. If, if you read the Spirit of Prophecy and that history dealing in the 1880s, that there is there's just these major problems within the church. And and so these continue. So that is the opposition to Jones and Wagner's message, which is in some ways it's a personal opposition, just shows up in the politics of the church. That is uh, the church organization and structure becomes a battleground over which this er- this uh, these differences are fought rather than in a Bible study. And Ellen White's constantly making appeal for brethren to set aside their differences, uh, to confess their sins, and to work with one another. And, And this is something that I believe is absolutely essential if God is going to have a movement that is is going to to actually accomplish anything of value. And, and leadership, you know, often you know, the leaders of movements think that because they're leaders, they need to kind of control what's happening. They need to be the one making decisions. They have to protect the work. You know, they want to have the funds and they want to funnel them and decide what's going to be done with them. And there is a lot of problems that exist when it comes to money. Uh, money can make people do really, really stupid things. And it's always something you have to be very, very careful about. And and people, you know, I believe that it's been one of the problems actually in the movement is that some of the differences have to do with people's perceptions about where money is going, um, who is getting the, the, the offerings and tithe within the movement. And we don't know all the details of it, but but it is something that is really common, that people are territorial over doctrine and ideas because because of receiving money. So that's why I don't think it's ever a good idea to uh, solicit funds for anything. If, if people want to donate to somebody, that's fine. But 
should never be a part of of a movement where we're asking people for money. That, that's that's something I think is just a, a problem. So when it comes to understanding this this idea, I mean, there's the simple the simple thing of organization. I'm just going to look at this text here. It's um, yeah, so Romans chapter 12. I'm just going to look at this first. Now we're very familiar with this first verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And there's a question there, which I'll answer in a moment. So when we think about the bodies, our bodies, we have to give them as a living sacrifice. That is everything that we are. We give it to God. And this is our reasonable service. Right? It's, it's reasonable. It's a service ministry uh, that we need to do that. And, and not to be conformed to this world. But also our mind has to be transformed. Right? So it's not just our body, but we need a mind that's transformed and uh, to prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. So God's will needs to be lived out in our lives and the decisions that we make. And then Paul goes on, he says, For I say, uh, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So one of the things we see here is that God has given to every man the measure of faith. Within the church, we need to recognize that God is using people, even people that are different than us. And that's why he goes on to say, for as we have many members in one body or many body parts, and all members have not the same office. So we have different parts of our body for different functions. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, and he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And there's other verses we could look at uh, regarding the body of Christ. Uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, it's going to talk about that as well. Now, there is a question, and I, I think it's pertinent to uh, to this discussion. Well, Sammy asks, even though that money is for tithe, is not good to contribute it from people. So I think the question is asking, what is tithe money to be used for? Can it be go to individuals or does it have to go to a church? And the way that I understand it is that every person has to decide for themselves. It's something between you and God. We should never tell people what they should do with their tithe money. People need to pay tithe, right? That is, you don't take... Uh, all the money that you earn and use it for yourself. Um, but it's between a person and God how they use that. And if a person is prayerful and considerate of, of the funds that, they, that they've that they been given, uh, they will use them to God's glory, not to glorify self, not for their own basic needs. So it, it's not a simple question. The idea that the, that the tithe just has to go to the church is easy to show that that's not the case. But uh, how people want to use that tithe is is something that they have to decide between themselves and God. You can't tell other people what to do with that. Now, obviously, we shouldn't just be giving tithe money to to help the poor. Right? Tithe is for ministry. Okay, so you know you can do offerings for the poor, but the tithe should go to ministry to support the ministry in some way. But I also don't really believe that we should have a, a clergy that's supported by just tithe money, you know, the professional 
sort of uh, ministers that are just getting paid all the time. I know the church does that, and that's part of organization. But I do believe that people people need to work even if they're doing ministry. They need to have a job. They need to have an occupation that they can do. Even if it doesn't 100% uh, support everything, they should as much as they can try to meet all their basic needs through work, even if they're involved in ministry. Um, but that's that's my personal views on that. It's not. Uh, I just think it's better. Paul did that, and uh, and he says it was a good thing to do. So <clears throat> there obviously can be exceptions to that. So so when we're dealing with this issue then of of organization, what we're really talking about here is is how Jones got caught up in the politics. He he becomes a casualty of the politics. Now, this presentation, an appeal for evangelical Christianity, if we remember, it's going to be um, May, uh, May 27th, uh, 1909. And seven years later, on May 28th, so seven years in a day later, E.J. Wagner is going to die. And his confession of faith, which is found on his desk, is the last thing he wrote. And so it's kind of interesting that Wagner's paper that we studied and Jones' uh, presentation have this seven years between them. Now, so he presents this at the General Conference in 1909. And what has happened is he's had his credentials removed. And and he's going to start talking about that. So uh, we're going to look at this and read a little bit of it. Uh, He says here, so he talked about the history and experience and some facts. And so we read some of that about some of the problems that were existing with uh, uh, the schools. And he says, the next step was this of the General Conference Committee in the council held in Gland, Switzerland, May 10th to 24th in 1907, in which without any notice or information of any kind to me, that any question was to be raised or any action taken in reference to me, and wholly in my absence in every sense, And without my having any kind of a chance to be heard, your executive committee tried my case, found me guilty, condemned me, and executed their judgment upon me, sent me their official notice to that effect, and then, without waiting for any reply from me as to whether I would repent or not, further executed their judgment by publishing it to the denomination and to the world. Of course, we don't know all the facts of this case, we're just we're just hearing what Jones has presented. But many of us have experienced this type of treatment, whether in an official way from a church, a church board, or sometimes uh, just in the court of public opinion within the church. You know, that to talk about people when they're not there, they're not able to share their story, we would recognize in civil courts as uh, something that is not just, right? If you have if you have a court, you have a trial, and the person we see that we see that and, uh, we see that going on right now <laughs> in the civil in the secular court, civil courts, where people can be tried without being there. Yeah, yeah, without being notified. Really, I didn't know that. But in the civil courts, that you have to be notified. Okay. By civil courts, I mean like non-religious courts, the secular courts, right? Oh like, yeah, right. So if a person, you know, if a person's accused of a crime, you know, he has to be notified that he's accused of a crime. He has to be able to find counsel and and to have a defense to d- to decide whether he's guilty or not. And he has to be heard. But if if the person is never heard, he never even knows that he's being tried, and his case his side is never heard and then he's uh you know judged and sentenced and that sense sentence is executed without him even knowing about it i mean that we would consider unjust but those types of things happen right they've happened within the church people have experienced this being disfellowshipped without being there and often on false grounds um, sometimes not even even if they happen to be there, they're not allowed to give an actual defense. And, and we saw, of course, this happened during the, the Protestant Reformation. 
uh, same type of things. People would be accused of all kinds of things and misrepresented. We saw it happen to Christ. So, um, so these types of things should not happen in the church. The exact circumstances here, I don't know what they are. We know what Jones is presenting, but it, it seems that whatever was done, it was done in a way that probably wasn't in accordance with the spirit of Christ. Now, I also think that Jones is making a mistake in trying to defend himself. So, well, you know, I understand that if, you know, if the church says, you know, we hear that something about you and we want to examine it, there is actually a process first. What What's the first step that would happen if you hear about some brother that's having some kind of trial or some sin that he's committing? Um, supposed to take two or three with you. Well, well, first you go to the person yourself. And I've had very few times when somebody has come to me personally uh, to talk about whatever the problem or issue was. I've had some people that have done it. There used to be a brother. Well, he's still in Warburg Church. And, and he would always just come to me himself and talk to me. And the most of the time, it would just be cleared up. Now, if he had come and talked to me and I was, you know, rebellious and I don't want to hear what you have to say and I'm in the right, well, then then he would have had to go and get two or three others and bring them. And the fact that he just came to me himself, one is he didn't talk to other people about it before he came to me, right? He came to me first. And then after we cleared it up, he didn't go and continue to talk to others about it after he had talked to me because it's cleared up. But that's that's one person I can think of, so maybe maybe two, you know, in, in, in sort of minor situations. But the vast majority of people, if if you're doing something that's wrong, well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to talk to everybody about it, right? And and what they will do, and I've had this experience, they they will go to people and say, you know, Theodore, he's this or that, right? And and the other people won't really argue, right? They they won't really agree. Um, they might say, well, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you're right. I don't know. But he'll do this with everyone. And then the person will come to me and say, everybody's saying this about you. I don't know if you've ever experienced somebody coming and saying, other people are saying this about you. I- I'm not saying it. You know, it's not my opinion, but everybody's telling me this about you. And really, nobody was telling him about that. He was telling everybody about it. And people weren't necessarily always arguing with him. They weren't necessarily disagreeing. Sometimes they might disagree or they might have. But but he would just take it as everybody's saying this about you, but they're not taking personal responsibility for it being their opinion. It, they're just because everybody's saying this about you. I need to come and talk to you. So the one is they don't want to own it, that it's something that they actually think. So what I would do is I just go to everyone else and say, you know, this brother came to you and he talked to you. Did he tell you about this? And did you agree with him? And they say, no, no, we don't agree at all. Well, well, he's saying everybody's agrees with him. Everybody or everybody's saying this about me. And they'd say, well, no, that's just him, right? He's just he's the one who thinks that about you, right? So I think we've all experienced that. So this type of 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 issue, and this this is what was happening within Adventism. Instead of addressing the person and trying to work with them and trying to understand them, uh, what is the body doing? It's trying to cut off its members. I mean, we know Jesus says, you know, if, if, if your right arm offend you, cut it off, right? It's better to go into life maimed than, uh, you know, to be cast into hell, right? But I don't think he's actually applying it in this sense. He's just saying there are things that you need to cut out of your life. So that's really a different issue. But if if the body is going to continue to cut off its members without uh, a proper process to try to heal the members, like if every time I get us, a, a, you know, a sore finger, um, and I can't play guitar. If I start cutting them off, eventually, well, it won't take very long. I won't be able to play guitar at all, right? So the first thing you want to do is you want to heal a member, a part of your body. That's suffering. And, and also, 
by not dealing with that issue. So sometimes we just ignore it. That's another issue. Um, and the whole body suffers. So what we want to have is healing. And, and there are ways to do it. And, and, and Warburg Church, at least the time that I was involved in it, I haven't been really involved for a few years, was very good at helping people heal when there was problems. We weren't out there just cutting off members. There are times that we had pastors that wanted to do that kind of stuff. But most of the time, it, it's the personal labor, and it's not even like the church doing it. It's just people within the church ministering to those who are struggling in some way. And, and not, not ignoring problems, not just hoping they go away, but actually addressing it. And that's a healthy church. But what we have here in Adventism at this time, uh, in the early 1900s is a church that's really, uh, divided and a house divided against itself cannot stand. Okay. So, so that was Jones experience. He's sharing his experience. Uh, and then he's going to talk about uh, his appeal, right? So the character of that action. One brother to whom I stated this fact of the committees trying me, condemning me and executing their judgment upon me without notice or information to me and wholly in my absence and without my knowledge, simply could not believe it. And I suppose does not believe it to this day. Possibly all of you cannot and do not believe it. Nevertheless, it, what is the perfect truth before God and the world? And those men know it. And my appeal before God in the world is, do you endorse that procedure, that process, and that action? Now it says here, by official action, May 31st, 1909, the General Conference in session did fully endorse the action and the process and the procedure of their committee and council at Glam, Switzerland, May of 1907, and did it in the same false basis and the same false premise um, or fa false principle, pardon me, as that of the course of the committee itself. The minutes of the general conference action of endorsement present, present uh, or pre of, of endorsement present that this action was taken as the necessary conclusion of what had been done at Barron Springs, Michigan in May of 1906, where the question, it is said, was fully considered. That this is not a true presentation at all is plain from the following facts. There was not any possibility of full consideration of the question at the General Conference at Barron Springs, Michigan, because the material steps that make the case had not been taken. Here they are. There was not, uh, he says, my leaflet, leaflet, History, Experience and Facts, was issued the latter part of March of 1906, and the statement of the General Conference Committee refuting, refuting what I had said in my leaflet and calling for proof was not published until the latter part of May 1906. My final word giving the call for proof was issued on July 1906. Without these three, all three publications, any such thing as a full consideration was impossible. Now, it is a fact that the General Conference at Barron Springs was held in May 8 to 18, 1906. And so before the statement of the General Conference Committee was issued, and much more before my final word was issued, giving the proofs called for in the statement. It is true that Elder Daniels had page proofs of the statement at the Barron Springs meeting and did read portions of it. But even so, there was no possibility of any full consideration of the case then because the evidence essential to the case was not all in. And at the utmost, only two of the three steps essential to the making of the case had yet been taken. Uh, there entered into the action of the council at Gland concerning me things that occurred only in March and April 1907, things that somebody told that another man did, and for which, even if it were true, I was never responsible at all. And this, the whole General Conference delegation knew when they took their action May 31st, 1909, for the president of the General Conference had publicly told it to them all the night of May 29th, and upon it, I had publicly said to them all, I am to be judged and condemned for what somebody told him that another man did. How those delegates could make out that the action at Gland in May of 1907 was the necessary conclusion of what occurred in Barron Springs in May 1906, when they all knew that into the action at Gland, there entered things that occurred only in March and April of 1907. 
possibly can they explain on the same principle of justice by which they can justify the action at Gland in judging and condemning me for what somebody told the president that another person did and with which I had nothing to do, even if it had been true. So the action of the general conference in session at Washington, D.C. on May 31st, 1909, justifying the action at Gland, Switzerland in May 1907 as the necessary conclusion of what occurred and what did not occur at Barron Springs, Michigan in May of 1906, even upon their own statement, is all in utter oblivion of the simple principle of justice that a person judged, even upon a hearing, by one set of men at one place can never by any possibility justify another set of men at another place in judging the same person in the same case without any hearing or any chance to be heard. Right. So, I mean, these are just simple forms of justice. But you can see how Jones is getting too caught up in this. I mean, it's true. It, I mean, if it's true what he's saying, it's unjust. But injustices occur. And the question is, how do we respond to injustices? So he says, uh, therefore, even upon their own statement in the action taken May 1st, right, he's going to go on that how the, in, this is an unjust. The wicked Jews when in general committee seeking to kill the Lord Jesus, even they could be checked with the word from one of their number. Doth our law judge a man or any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? In my case, it seems that no such question was even asked. And if it was asked, it is certain that it had no effect to check the proceedings. The profession is that your denominational organization is practically the reproduction of the, that established by Moses. But nowhere in all the writings or the order of Moses is there any sanction given or implied to any such thing as this that was done by your committee in this case. In the Mosaic order, it is specifically declared justice, justice, that which is altogether just shalt thou follow. And in order that justice might be followed and found, the Mosaic order ordained that in all manner of trespass and of controversy between men, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges. In this case of the procedure of your committee, only one party was present. The other party, the accused, was not present. He was not asked to be present, and he was neither notified nor informed that the matter was to be touched at all. And in his absence, in every possible sense, without his being heard and without his having any chance to be heard, he was tried and condemned at a place 4,000 miles away and the execution of their judgment upon him was the first intimation that he had of the matter in any way, whatever. I appeal from that action. I appeal from that process. I appeal from that procedure upon the scriptures. I appeal upon the Mosaic order, according to which it is professed that you are organized. I appeal in the name of Christianity. I appeal for not a single step prescribed by Christ or in the New Testament was taken in this case. In the name of only human justice, I appeal. I appeal even by that one single remaining decent trait of the wicked Jews against Jesus, that even they had yet enough remaining respect for common justice, that they could be checked by the word, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Will you regard this appeal? Or do you endorse the action, the process and the procedure of your committee in this case? Now, the one thing I can say that I know about this from, not from Joan's perspective, but from the church's perspective, from the historian's perspective, is the main problem they had with Jones is that he didn't accept uh, the organization of the church in this case of how they addressed him. So it's, it's, it's his, his opposition to what happened to him is evidence that it was just. Does that make sense? So the very fact that he is so adamant against what happened to him, they take as evidence of his guilt. The fact that he protests. And, and this is the same with the Protestants. I mean, the very idea that they're protesting is the real problem, right? You know, for the Catholic Church. Like, people should just submit to this authority because it's, the church, the church has decided, even if the church has not followed justice, when the person then rebels, 
because that's what Jones is really doing. He's being rebellious. It, it hardens people in their decision uh, against A.T. Jones. And that happens time and time again within organizations. The fact that people won't submit to something that's unjust. So I know Kelly's not here this evening, but, <clears throat> you know, when he was disfellowshipped on July 7th, uh, 2000 and I'm trying to think if that was 2012 or 2013, like I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, it was July 7th. I remember that. Now he was allowed to be there, but they, they did some studies with him where they proved he was wrong. And when it came a chance to defend himself, he didn't really have a chance to defend himself. So once they brought it to the business meeting or wherever they're going to disfellowship him, the disfellowship meeting, many people aren't going to be there because they already know that the case has been decided. And, you know, there's just so much injustice. But even before that, it's already decided that he can't present anything about the 2520 on Facebook or social media or by email, and that to do so is rebellion against the church. And so what they actually charge a person with is not what they believe, but the fact that they are rebellious towards church authority, even if that church authority is unjust, right? I mean, it's the church really does not have authority to – um, tell us what we should do on social media, what opinions we can share, what we can study in private, right? The, the church doesn't have that. Authority. Yeah, it reminds me of, of that, that dream that, that, that is mentioned in the spirit of prophecy, uh, where the accused is being lambasted because he or she spoke against our order. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, we all are sensible enough to recognize that people need to be heard, that there needs to be a process to understand a person's position. And yet when we are treated unjustly, we have to recognize that we have to submit to that injustice, that when we try to fight against injustice, we enter on Satan's ground. And, and it's a hard lesson to learn. If we're falsely accused and we we get riled up and and start a campaign to show how unjust it is, but we, we've walked into a trap because that's exactly what they want to happen. Right? And then telling you to do it on not doing it on your personal time is I yeah, mean, that's that's horrible. <laughs> I learned the best thing to do is just ignore it, let people do whatever they want. Yeah. If, if people want to be unjust, if people want to spread gossips and rumors, if people want to cut me off and and uh, disfellowship me or whatever they want to do, um, or punish me in some way, or restrict you know my involvement in the church or in the movement, that's their choice. And the best thing to do is to submit to God and not to make a huge deal about it. That doesn't mean that you may not mention it as an illustration or something like that. But you can't take it personally. And every time people take it personally, they walk into a trap. I, I hope you can see what I mean by that. And so far in this movement, I don't actually believe I've ever walked into the trap, at least not, not completely. Because, you know, I, I had a lot of misrepresentations being spread about me uh, by Tabo and Parminder to Jeff and other people. Now, in the end, you know, Jeff ended up still supporting uh, July 18th. But if I had tried to defend myself in that whole situation, it, it would have made things much more difficult for the truth. But just allowing God to take care of it, that was the best thing I could do. And I'd learned that lesson earlier in life when injustices had happened and I had tried to defend myself. Um, because one is we believe... So so the people who are doing the injustices, do they know that they're doing injustices? Do they know probably what they're not, doing? Probably not. Some, some are conditioned 
their whole life to act well, a certain way, you know, I don't know. Well, I think they, I think they do know what they're doing. Uh, to be honest, I, I never used to think that people did, but I've come to learn that people, people do this. They understand how to get what they want. And so they know that they can say one thing of what they want, you know, so uh, we're trying to redeem this person or the it's, it's the church is suffering because of this person's view or opinion or idea or whatever it is. And they're going to do it in a way that's unjust and the reason they do it in a way that's unjust is so that you will react to the injustice. And then they can say, aha, see how this person acts. Yeah. Right. So it, it is a strategy that evil people use. Right. They push you uh, so that you will, you know, show your hand or whatever you want, however you want to describe it. That's, I don't know if that's the best illustration. But show your true colors or whatever they want to think it is. So this person is rebellious. So you treat them unjustly. And are they going to respond in something that can be interpreted as rebellion? Yes. And Jones fell for the trap, right? And and he should have just allowed God to defend him instead of him defending himself. And, and I've had to do that in other situations where um, instead of defending myself, I learned by just allowing God and being patient over time, in the end, I was justified. It was it was clear that I was not the guilty party and that the rumors and the gossip were not true. Now, ultimately, you know, we're going to have to wait till heaven until that is seen clearly. But uh, we can trust that God knows the truth. And no matter what any man, any power that they have over us, if we give into that power, that is, if we really give them that power by responding we, we've lost. And so we need to just trust that God's going to take care of things. So I think Jones is making a mistake here in this appeal for evangelical Christianity, even though he thinks he's justified in doing so. And in a sense, he is justified in doing so. But because it's it's a self-justification, it, it's going to backfire for him personally. So he says, um, but that your committee went beyond the wicked Jews was not all. When the Jews, wanting to kill Paul, desired to have judgment against him in his absence, even a heathen Roman laid down the principle of justice that it is not the manner of the Romans to do thus before that which he is accused, have the accusers face to face and have license uh, to justice, but upon the plain, plain principle of only heathen Roman justice. And I appeal from the action, the process, the procedure of the General Conference Committee of Seventh-day Adventists in this case. Nor yet is this all. Wycliffe was three times tried by the papacy. John Haas and Jerome were tried, condemned, and executed by the papacy. Luther was tried and condemned by the papacy. But never once, not one of them without a full and open hearing, or at least, or at the least, a full and open notification and citation of summons. Wycliffe had had full opportunity to answer each of the three times. Haas three times and Jerome twice were heard for hours. Jerome 12 hours. Luther was heard as long as he chose to speak, first in his native German and afterward in Latin. Now, the one thing here about this, like if Jones was writing this about somebody else who was being mistreated, that would be a different story, wouldn't it? I mean, Jones commenting on someone else going through yeah. that? Yes. But when, when you're doing it because of the injustice done to you personally, it, it's not productive. Now, and, you know, and often, you know, I mean, I bring up myself as situations where, you know, I've been treated unjustly, but I'm, I'm not protesting. Uh, I, I'm not saying, you know, I was treated so unfairly and this needs to be rectified. I'm I think just, you're, just I'm, make, you're just making points of things. Yeah, just making the points of these things. And, and to me, what matters is how we respond when we're treated unjustly. You know, it's not railing for railing, right? We don't enter onto the ground that they are using. But if I was defending someone else, that would be a different matter. If somebody I saw being treated unjustly, uh, there's definitely nothing wrong with, with stating that. But the problem often is when we see somebody treating unjustly, being treated unjustly, uh, we might go to them and say, boy, you're being treated unjustly. But are we going to speak out 
Often we don't. We allow that injustice to continue. And then when it happens to us, you know, we wonder why nobody's coming to our defense. Right. So so I do believe that it is important to speak out against injustice, but just not injustice done to you personally. I hope that makes sense. Okay. The writings of men were condemned and even executed by fl the flames, by the papacy in the absence of the men. But never were the men themselves so dealt with by the papacy in their absence, without full and open notice and summons to them to be present. And if the man were accessible, even though he were dead, he was brought to the place of trial so that he should be present. You know, uh, that, you know, that's, it's a nice thing to do to take the dead body <laughs> to the trial. Anyway. And when once the papacy, after having regularly summoned Luther, took action before he had full time in which to appear, history has set it down against her. Thus, even the forms of the just and impartial inquest had not been observed. Luther had been declared heretic, not only without having been heard, but even before the expiry, ex, expiry of the period named for his appearance, the passions and nowhere do they show themselves stronger than in religious discussions, overleap all the forms of justice. Strange proceedings in this respect occur, not only in the Church of Rome, but in the Protestant churches also, which have turned aside from the gospel. In other words, in all places where the truth is not, everything done against the gospel is deemed lawful. We often see men who, in any other case, would scruple to commit the smallest injustice, not hesitating to trample underfoot all forms and all rights when the matter in question is Christianity and the testimony born to it. And that's from Diabe Gne, History of the Reformation, book four, chapter one, page seven, paragraph two. And Luther said of it, it is the style and fashion of the court of Rome to cite, admonish, accuse, judge, and pronounce sentence of condemnation all in one day, against a man who is at such a distance from Rome that he knows nothing at all of the proceedings. What answer would they give to this? Doubtless, they forgot to purge themselves with a hellebore before proceeding to such falsehoods. And, you know, one of the things that I believe that has been a fault of the movement, even when um, Jeff was in charge of it, was this type of judgments against people's views and opinions when they weren't heard, and I seen it happen to other people, and and I spoke out against it when it happened to other people. Um, I believe that there's some people, even though you know we could say we could look at the people and say there were problems with them. I just don't think it was fair in that they would condemn a person for something that they supposedly did or said, but they have never they don't have a chance to defend themselves. And that happened many times with FFA. Anyway, therefore, not only upon the principle of mosaic justice, not only upon the plain principle of only heathen Roman justice, but also upon the principle of even papal justice. I appeal from the action, the process of the procedure of the General Conference Committee of Seventh-day Adventists in this case. That such a thing could be done by or in the presence of not less than 100 men, all professing not only to be Christians, but to be special representatives of Christ and his cause and the last message of mercy to men in the world is difficult to believe, but that it is entirely true is most certain and they know it. So, you know, he's making more of his appeals here. I don't want to go through everything, but I'm going to read a bit more here. Nor yet is this all. I cited the requirement of the Mosaic order, according to which it is professed that you are organized that all manner of trespass or all controversy between men, the cause of both parties should come before the judges. In this connection, there appears in this case another egregious feature, that is, that the accusing party, which alone was present, was itself the judge, and thus judge in their own case. See this in the plain facts. Who were the both parties in this matter? None other than the General Conference Committee and myself. Well, whereupon the second call, I had the people, uh, I had told the people where I stand. The General Conference Committee as such entered the case by an official statement to refute what I had said. In this, the General Conference Committee as such made itself one of the parties to the matter, to the demand of the committee for proofs and how I knew 
etc. I replied, if they desired that the controversy should go further, it was then their turn to disprove my proof, etc. Instead of doing this by publishing another statement of refutation or explanation, the committee met 4,000 miles away and took judicial cognizance of my public utterances and published statements and replied to them by this action, process and procedure of trying and condemning me without any hearing or any possible opportunity to be heard, but wholly in my absence in every respect. Therefore, it stands demonstrated that the General Conference Committee, as one of the parties in this controversy of their own seeking, did make themselves not only judges of their own case, but also made themselves accusers and prosecutors and judges, all three in one. <sighs> it's kind of discouraging. Uh, he talks about uh, the civil court, what they say. We live under a guarantee that reaches back to the beginnings of our law and is securely planted in every constitution of civilized government. And no one shall be punished until they, he has been heard. And above this fundamental guarantee, there can be set no higher prerogative. Can American judge without abuse of judicial discretion condemn anyone who has not had his day in court? Now, of course, we know nowadays um, we have the court of public opinion. People often are are judged before they ever have a chance to be heard. So we know there's lots of injustices that occur in our world. We, we don't have a world of justice. We have forms that purport to be justice, but often injustices are done in the name of justice. So we know it's important that a person has an opportunity to be heard. And um, so he's going to go on a lot about this, just seeing ahead. So this uh, paragraph here, where it says, in the late general conference, the impression was conveyed and it appeared in print as authorized by the committee, that what the general conference, the general, com general conference committee, it should be, had done or what the general conference might do would not affect my church membership, but only my relations to the general conference, that the general conference leaves to the local churches entirely the matter of receiving and dropping the names of those who not are who are not considered as in fellowship. Okay, so he's just saying in the general conference, the, the late general conference, that means the previous one, there was oppression conveyed and it appeared in print as authorized uh, by the committee that what the general conference committee had done or what the general conference committee might do would not affect my church membership but only my relations to the general conference. The general conference leaves to the local churches, okay, I see, entirely the matter, matter of receiving and dropping the names of those who are not considered as in fellowship. Now, all of that talk and impression conveyed amounts to just nothing at all in the presence of the well-known fact that the president of the union conference, H.W. Cottrell, and the president of a local conference, S.N. Haskell, and another man, W.C. White, all three of them leading members of the General Conference Committee, by personal presence and pressure, tried hard and did their best in August and September of 1908 to get the local church, of which I am still a member in good standing, to put me under the censure of the church. And they did it in the name of the General Conference. They tried it in the same old way, too, without any hearing or any chance to be heard. And they told the church that if they did not do it, they would be ignoring the general conference. I have the records of it, but they failed. So this happened to me to some degree, not with the general conference, but with uh, a ministerial conference. So there was a group of ministers back in 2012. Um, I think it was the Edmonton ministers or something like that. Uh, they put a lot of pressure on my pastor at the time to deal with me. But this is what he told me. He says, you know, I was told that I need to deal with you. And what Heidi and I did, and this wasn't really, so the pastor had done a sermon against me at a business meeting, right? And, and we went to the Alberta conference um, to talk to them about it, asking what we should do. So it wasn't us in protest, you know, about how unjust all of this was. We just, we just asked, what is it that you would like us to do? And then what they said, well, we think your pastor should sit down with you and, and study with you and, and talk about this. And that's, that's what our pastor did. He actually came over and he had a binder of, with all these, um, that he had collected for about, uh, four years, I think, of conversations that he had had with people about me. 
and 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 told me where he got all of, every bit of information that he believed about me where he had gotten it. So he had never ever talked to me about it before. You know, he'd never come to me and said, you know, people have said this about you. What do you say? He, he was asked by the, the Alberta conference to do that. And he did that. So we sat down and then he apologized to me afterwards. He said, I apologize for what I did. And I said, it'd be nice if you apologized in front of the church, but uh, he didn't. <laughs> I, I thought it would be good for him if he did that. Not so much for me. I just thought because he looked quite bad in how he had treated me. And I thought that if he apologized in front of the church, that would be help in the problems that he was having with the church that he wasn't really aware of. But anyway, the point here is that um, that often what happens is that uh, there are there are pressures to deal with people. Now, in this case, it wasn't from you know conference, just from a group of ministers who were highly opposed to the twenty five twenty. And then also I had uh, my my present pastor. So back in 2020, there is a group of elite pastors who uh, in North America who meet together. And when that publication went out uh, in the Tennessee and the ad, they contacted my pastor and they said, we know that Theodore Turner is your church member and we want to know what you're going to do about him. Something to that effect. Now, of course, he wasn't going to do anything. Uh, but he says, you know, you, you got the attention of this important group of pastors. They're all the elite pastors and, and they knew about me and they knew that. And so they contacted him, which he thought was, you know, quite an honor, I guess. <laughs> Not really, but, uh, it, it, quite a serious thing to be contacted by these people that, that, that his church would have this attention. Uh, drawn to it because of one of its members. And the question is, what are, what are you doing about this uh, church member who's in your church? So uh, kind of an interesting you know, point that that if really it's the local church, we need to let the local church decide about its church members that it sees on a regular basis, not some people who don't know a church member, like the conference. They may not know that church member personally. So they could just have all kinds of impressions, hear gossip and rumors. So anyway, it's kind of interesting how things uh, work themselves out sometimes. Now, in the world of politics, we know that. Um, what you know, some, what's that? What, what, what happened to the end? Of, what happened now? What happened well, at the end? Of that? Well, I, I, I'm not I'm not officially um, dis being disciplined, which bothers me. Because I've told the pastor, you know, if I'm going to be disciplined, I need to be a dif- disciplined official, not unofficially. Like technically, my view is if you're a member in good and regular standing, you should be allowed to do sermons in church. If you're not allowed to do sermons in church, it should be because the church has voted and decided that you're unfit to do sermons in church. It shouldn't be decided by a pastor or a board, Right. You haven't heard anything back from that? Anything since? No, I, I've never cared oh. about it. I, I just thought it was funny. Oh, yeah. I mean, one, one of my problems is I've never really had any um, attachment to the church organization. I know that sounds odd or maybe bad. I mean, yeah. my attachment's always been to my local church and to the people I know. So I don't really care about what you know, some conference says, whether it's the general conference or a local conference or what a pastor says, or even what an individual says who doesn't know me personally. So that is an opinion that somebody has who I'm not, I don't actually really know. I mean, I might, you know, they might be an acquaintance. I might have seen them, talked to them one or two times. I don't really care about their opinion, even if they have power over me, as they may believe that they do. They they actually don't. I mean, I had this one pastor, you know, he, he twice he threatened he was going to make my life miserable. And I, I said, there's no way that you can make my life miserable. I mean, you could try, but you'll never be able to do it. And uh, he didn't like that. But it's true. There was nothing he could do. He didn't have any power over me to make my life miserable. No. Uh, what, maybe, thing, what, a thing, what a thing to say for a pastor to say that. Yeah. But, but the thing is... 
I mean, nobody has that power over me. I mean, they could throw me in prison. I'm still not going to be miserable. It, it, it's not, it, it's not easy to make me miserable. It's almost impossible, right? Because, because of my trust in God, no matter what happens, I can trust that I can have joy in God, even in trials, right? We all have that ability. But if you, if you give somebody the power over you to make your life miserable, that's a power you have yielded to them, right? Uh, they, yes. They don't have that power unless you give it to them. So I just would never give it to anybody. That's, that's the way that I look at it. And that's because my hopes are not in this world or in the things of this world or in position or standing with the church or, you know, the opinions of others. If, if, if my, if my view was like his, that the opinions of others matter, then he could have made my life miserable because he could have, you know, ruined my reputation by telling all kinds of falsehoods, which he, he tried to do. But the fact is people know me and they know everything he said wasn't true. At least the people who love me and care about me. The other people who might have believed them, they don't really matter anyway. So I think Jones made a mistake. And, and I've made those same mistakes earlier in life. But, but he made a mistake in trying to defend himself. In a sense, he was giving them power over him, which he didn't need to yield, but he did. So a lot of these things he's saying, they are true. You know, these are, these are the things of justice. But let God be just and every man a liar. I appeal always just to God if I'm being treated unjustly. I know that God can oversee those things and that the enemy cannot do anything against the truth but for the truth. And if Jones had made this appeal, it would have been much, much better. But he he chose to try to appeal to them instead of to God. Now, um, he says here, what constitutes good standing? What then is this wording? The first sentence runs thus. In the matter of the ministerial credentials held by A.T. Jones, declaring him to be an ordained minister of good standing in the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, etc. While the sentence does not specifically say in words that I was not of good standing, the clear implication is just that. What then constitutes a minister of good standing in the general conference? Is it moral character? Then, while I do not state it to appear at all as in any wise good, but only as the fact is, it is the truth simply of the fact pertinent that when the statement was written and that action taken, I had been for 30 years an ordained minister of such standing morally that no charge or suggestion of any immoral conduct had ever been made against me. Since that action was taken, there has been a lot of it by report and rumor, and it is probable that there may yet be a lot more. But when the action was taken, there was no such charge and never had been any. So that absolutely nothing of that kind entered into the case. Morally, then, I was at that time of good standing. Right Now, this often happens when they try to take someone down. They spread rumors and gossips about some immoral act the person may have committed in somebody's mind, right, without actually even examining the case. And so sometimes people can be attacked, uh, and Kelly knows the situation like that with a friend of ours, you know, being accused of something. Sometimes just there are things you can be accused of. That's enough. It doesn't have to even ever be proved. Just the accusation is enough uh, to disqualify a person. Is it doctrinal integrity that constitutes a minister of good standing in the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists? What constitutes doctrinal integrity? It has always been the boast of Seventh-day Adventists that they have no creed, but that the Bible and the Bible only, as the religion of Protestants, is the sole and sufficient standard of truth, of faith, and of teaching. When I became connected with the Seventh-day Adventists, it was preached, and it was the only preaching that was offered, that Seventh-day Adventists claimed that to have only the truth of the Bible, but that they did not claim to have yet all of the truth that is in the Bible, that while they had, while what they had was the truth of the Bible, there was yet more truth to come forth from the Bible, and that they held themselves open and perfectly free to go on in the Bible, in the path of the just, that shines more and more into the perfect day. Unto this more and more truth, until all the truth of the Bible and all its fullness should be found in that perfect day. And I never expected anything else that this people would allow themselves to be led into all the truth of the Bible and in the matter of organization, as in everything else. That I repeat, 
is the only preaching and the only basis upon which I became a Seventh-day Adventist connection of the Seventh-day Adventist connection. And just there I've always stood. There I stand now, and there I shall ever stand, according to the only proposition or principle on which I entered the Seventh-day Adventist connection, and the holding and preaching of the truth of the Bible as it is in the Bible, whatever that truth may be, would be the only fair standard or test of doctrinal integrity. And nobody has attempted to show anything that I preach or teach, whether by voice or in writing, is not the truth of the Bible as it is plainly in the Bible. So often what happens is a person is accused, again, they're accused of things, but it's not, that nobody's ever going to sit down and examine what they're saying. And in this case, Jones doesn't even have any accusation regarding him teaching error. He goes on, yet while Seventh-day Adventists proclaim that they have no creed, there has for many years been in print an accepted statement of fundamental principles, which they hold to as certain well-defined points of faith. If it should be held that belief of these fundamental principles as well-defined points of faith is the standard of doctrinal integrity that decides whether a man is a minister of good standing, then I say that I hold fully and truly without any interpretation or qualification every one of these fundamental principles and well-defined points of faith exactly as I always did and exactly as they stand printed in the Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook of 1907 the very year in which this action was taken by the General Conference Committee upon the implication that I was not a minister in good standing. So we know with Wagner, this was not the case. So Wagner had ended up, and and Wagner, in his falling away, he had divorced his wife, married his secretary. We know also that he says he did not believe the 2300 days. So Jones is not in that the same boat as Wagner. Jones is not being accused of being immoral. And he's not being he's not being accused of having doctrinal error. Again, in that 1908 Thanksgiving campaign number in the Review and Herald, it was especially a commendation of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination to the other people of the world as a basis of those other people's making donations to this denomination. In that paper of which nearly 800,000 copies were printed and supposed to have been circulated, there was published a series of statements on what we believe in each and every one of these things I do believe. Thus, to this day, I'm not only in perfect harmony with the proposition, the preaching, and the principles of doctrinal integrity upon which I entered the Seventh-day Adventist connection, but I'm also in perfect harmony with every item that has been officially published as a statement of the fundamental principles or the defined points of faith of Seventh-day Adventists. Therefore, not only upon any published or known denominational statements, he should be a minister in good and regular standing at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, but they say that he's not, so that There must be something else. And it is plain, therefore, that their implication and their action upon the implication that I was not a minister of good standing was based upon something else than any commonly known or recognized definition or embodiment of fundamental principle as well-defined point of faith in the Seventh-day Adventist. Where then did they get this something else? Where did they get this new and unknown thing of which they themselves erected into a standard of faith and practice and a test of fellowship and upon which they would proclaim against a man who is in full harmony with every principle of morals and with every stated or known recognized fundamental principle or defined point of faith of Seventh-day Adventists and the implication that he is not a minister of good standing. Where did they get this something else? This formerly unknown thing which they erected into such a test wherever they got it or however they got it, it demands the question, what right have a few men, a mere committee, to set up new and formerly unknown tests of ministerial standing and without any publication of it or notification or information to anybody, not even to the one most concerned, apply those tests as far as in the power of the committee lies and to the total destruction of the ministerial and denominational standing of any man. Now that's where we're going to look at next week. We're going to go into detail about this. We're going to read, continue to read this paper. So, you know, Jones isn't completely wrong here. I think he's wrong to make this appeal. For himself, uh, but the things that he's saying are, are sound. They're not something that's rebellious at this point. What we've read, anyway, we're uh, going to close with prayer. Any final comments before we do so? Yeah, Paul's conduct during his trial are a good example. Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. Please be with each person. 
and we ask that the meetings tomorrow will go according to thy will. We pray for Dwight and his mom and uh, that things will work out. You know, Lord, the trials that he faces and the pressures. We just hold them up in prayer that you can continue to use them and strengthen him. Be with each person in their personal study and they walk with you. May your angels watch over each one of us and our families and help us, Lord, to represent you to all around. Again, we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.